As entrepreneurs, we understand the roller coaster of emotion that comes with bringing a business to life. Most of the reason that companies fail is because the founder doesn't get out of the way of the growth of the company. The reality is, whether you're building a company or scaling your side hustle, there's no way to completely avoid the chaos. Everybody wants to be in an environment of control and not chaos. Now balance that with your personal life, that's where it gets even harder. Your business is something that you need to pour into like a relationship. Get the answers from top business leaders, authors, founders, and productivity experts so you can organize the chaos in your business. There's no such thing as common sense. There's only documentation. Welcome to Organize Chaos, the show where you can take a page out of business leaders' playbooks with me, your host, Chris Ronzio. What's up, everyone? Thank you for joining me for another episode of Organize Chaos Live. Today, we have a very special guest, and I can't wait to introduce him to you. Right before the call, we got into a deep conversation about sea otters. So today we're going to be talking mostly about marketing, inbound marketing. This guy is a whiz when it comes to that stuff, but he also lives by the shore in California and has some fun facts about sea otters. So don't be surprised if that sneaks its way into our conversation. So we're going to get into inbound marketing and specifically all about inbound marketing in 2022. Of course, there's a lot of challenges going on in this environment. So we're gonna talk about how to navigate this changing changing landscape, maybe some common pitfalls for your business, strategies that your business should be using to really ace marketing. Now to kick things off, I'd love to hear in the chat, what marketing challenge is your business facing? What marketing challenge is your business facing? So think about that and while you reply, join me in introducing and welcoming Dan Tyre. Dan is a 14 year veteran of HubSpot. He was hired as employee number six. So we should probably be talking about retention instead of inbound marketing. Maybe we'll get into that a little bit. But while he was initially the first salesperson, Dan's helped uh, expand the sales team through management, recruiting and training. He coined the industry term marketing. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And he is the co-author of a book called Inbound Organization, How to Build and Strengthen Your Company's Future Using Inbound Principles. Please welcome Dan Tyre. Boom. Oh, that was awesome. I ought to bring you on the road with me. Man, that was tremendous. Anytime. I will open for you as your opening act. I know that you spent this morning in, what'd you say, Colombia and Israel and everywhere that you sign on and speak via Zoom. So thanks for being here. Oh, I'm happy to do it. I've been looking forward to this all week, right? You know, I'm a big Chris Ronzio fan, right? And I have been for five years, right? Whenever you're feeling like a slug, you just text me and you're like, Tyre, say all those nice things you were saying on the LinkedIn live thing. And I'm happy to (laughs) deliver that. Uh, Just one correction. I'm not a California guy. I'm an Arizona guy. I was just living in California for eight weeks in a place called Prunedale. And uh, anybody ever hear of Prunedale? If you've heard of Prunedale, Put it in the um, the comment section. Uh, I'll eat my HubSpot t-shirt if you've ever heard of Prunedale because <laughs> I've been all over. you never heard of it, have you? No, no, I've never uh, heard of it. It's between Monterey and um, Santa Cruz, right? It's the sea otter capital of the world, right? And uh, can we drop some sea otter like facts on Let's this hear audience? It. Let's uh, hear it. They're not myths. They're not rumors. These are facts, right? Because I was there for eight weeks. It was amazing. Right. Uh, it's 50 degrees, which I couldn't say while I was there because everybody in Arizona would get all angry at me. Uh, and um, like sea otters are pretty amazing. Right. Put in the comments if you've ever seen a sea otter. Yes, sea otter. No sea otter. Right. Um, and uh, sea otters here, I'll give you like six facts. Sea otters are the only <laughs> marine mammal without a layer of blubber. Hmm. OK. A newborn pups cannot sink or dive. They only float. Right. The reason they float, and you know this because I just told you this eight minutes ago, is that they have 10 times the amount of hair per square inch than you have on your head. Even you with all that great hair, right? You have about 100,000 hairs on your head. A sea otter has a million hairs per square inch. That's what makes them float. I don't right? float in the pool. I don't know if you float, but maybe I need like more hair plug, 10 times as much hair, and then I would float. Well, if you had a million pieces of hair, you'd float on your <laughs> hair. Right. Uh, That's the key to being sea otter. They're like funny animals because they float on their stomach. And um, in this like Prunedale sea otter slough, which is like a river that runs into the ocean, then runs it back to the river. They just pop up like you're in your kayak and run like, boom, like five feet away from you. Like, oh, my goodness, that's cute. Except 
right? They also use tools. They're one of the few animals in the animal kingdom that use tools. I don't know if they use like power drills and chainsaws, but they are known for using tools. They have pockets under their armpits, right? I don't know if they keep their tools under their, in their pockets, but that's what I would do if I was a sea otter. <laughs> and then they eat 25% of their body fat every day, every day, right? So that's 12 pounds of seafood. Like if you were 150 pounds, I think in the briefing meeting, you said you're a little bit more than 150 pounds, but if you were 150 pounds, right, that would give you, you'd have to eat 37 pounds of like food every day. All right. That's all I got on sea otters. Is that a pretty good rundown? That was amazing. Everyone that's tuning in, uh, I bet you didn't expect to learn this much about sea otters today. So you know what? We otter transition into inbound marketing. But oh, like what I did there. So this sort of, <laughs> I, there was no better, no other transition. There's no other way to get off the sea otter topic, but thank you for that. Uh, inbound marketing. So this is something that has been around for a while, but it feels like it's different today than it was when we were trying to teach people this term a decade ago. Would you agree with that? Uh, a huge change. And I don't really like to refer to it as marketing okay. because today marketing is everything. Right. Mm. It used to be marketing was like a little tiny piece. It was demand gen. It was brand. Right. Today, uh, marketing is your messaging. It's your social media. It's your branding. It's demand gen. It's your sales process. It's your recruiting process. And it's your growth process. The foundation of marketing is really growth. And uh, oh, that's the other thing I have to mention to you. It's the pronunciation of marketing. Say it like you're from Brooklyn. Schmarketing. Schmarketing. Yeah, sales and marketing pushed together. Some people think it's smart marketing. It's not. It's sales and marketing pushed together, which I made up in 2007 when I was drunk. Right. I was meeting with um, Mike Volpe, who was our CMO at the time. And uh, I, I, as the first salesperson for HubSpot, I used to cold call. Don't tell anybody. But I used to cold call people. And I'm like, you should start with HubSpot. And um like uh, we started 90 days in getting inbound leads and I'm talking to our CMO. I'm like, this is amazing. People like want to talk with me. He's like, yeah, we just started a software company on that concept in 2007. I'm like, well, give me more. He's like, I can't. I'm like, why? He's like, I have to like build content. I'm like, we'll build the content. He's like, I have no headcount. I'm like, I'll give you sales headcount. And he looked at me, he goes, you would give me sales headcount for marketing. I'm like, it's not sales. It's not marketing. It's schmarketing. And it was easy for me to say, because it wasn't really my headcount. It belonged to Mark Roberts, who was the vice president of sales at HubSpot, who took us from zero to $100 million in seven years. And um, Professor Thomas Steenberg from Harvard uh, uh, Business School overheard the conversation and wrote in a, a white paper about schmarking. It's the first time it was ever in print. And uh, that was me being a goofball, right? And, but it makes so much sense. And in the early days, that's what it was. Inbound was tricking out your website. So that uh, people would come to your website and they would see that you were serviced in that region or that area or in that language or that company, right? And uh, like if they came to the training website, they would see that you are a global company. They would see that you provide documentation. They would see that you have free stuff, that you have uh, stuff behind paywalls, that you have all of this kind of information. They would drop their contact information. And then uh, a salesperson would call. And in the old days, marketing was like this little slice, right? They did the brand, they did Legion. Today, what percentage of the sales process do you uh, think uh, a prospect wants to go through before they talk to a salesperson? Today, I think they want to yeah. go through most of it on their own, yeah. kind of AC. Yeah, yeah, it's 100%. They're like, uh, a hundred. I, I never want to talk to a salesperson. I'm like, no, don't you want a discount? They're like, yeah, I want that. But can I get that online? Right. Yeah. And so marketing has moved from just like being a niche, right? In the old days, as um, like being in sales for 42 years, I, it was all about me, right? I got all the glory. In fact, when I didn't hit my number, it was always marketing's fault. I threw them right under the bus. I'm like, come on. Right. Marketing gave me either not enough leads. So it's their fault. Or they gave me too many leads. I didn't know what to call. So it's their fault. Right. And then I would take the lead. I would like qualify it. I would bring it into a demo. I would answer objections. I would bring. It. So I got 90% of the money. I got all the budget. Right. When I serve on boards, right. In the old days, 
you'd bring the salesperson in or the sales VP and be like, okay, we gave you a million dollars last year. What did you do with it? It's like we hired 13 heads. We brought in $2.7 million worth of incremental business. Bring in the marketing guy and say, what did you do with the 600,000 we gave you? And he'd be like, well, it's kind of hard to say, look at his shoes. It's bifurcated. And then be like, all right, you get $400,000 next year. You cut his budget, right? Because he couldn't show the attribution. Today, right? With attribution and like uh, how important it is exactly that. Most people understand, right? That it's really shared kind of process and right. Marketing equals growth. So right. In the old days, you hired more salespeople today. You hire a good marketer, right? Who can bring the leads to the house, who can optimize the website, who can uh, provide the information at every stage of the buyer's journey, because today's sales process is so much different than before. Cause it's all done online. Right. People start, get all excited. I'm sure you see this at training. They get all excited. They're like, let's go, let's go. And then they ghost you. They just leave. Maybe not you because like training has got a good product program, but sometimes, and then they don't come back for a year. Then they come back and they expect you to know exactly where they were a year ago, even if it's a different rep, even if it's a different contact. They're, and if you cycle in and say, oh yeah, yeah, I see you were, had a big like scrum about a year ago about possibly, um, purchasing some technology, then you're on the front end of that process. And if you don't have that, tell me about a little bit about yourself. You're on the back end of that process. So now in 2022, uh, marketing equals growth. So if there was ever an area of the business that we needed to organize the chaos, it might be all of that <laughs> that you just mentioned. It's, okay. it's a, it's a tough area of a business to wrap your arms around. I think it used to be easier in the past where, you know, it was kind of like a, a direct response. You write a sales letter or something. There's call to action immediately. You've got sales reps who close the deal. And what happened with inbound is it started to be a lot more nurturing, right? Like a lot longer cycle where we wanted to get people to know us over a long period of time before they're ready to convert. Right. And so that was the, the transition. I think a lot of businesses went through and starting to invest in inbound. So how has that changed? today is there too much content is there less closing is there like how, what has that done a decade or two later 14 years later since you first kind of cracked this code uh, so great question and number one it is harder right uh for a couple of reasons uh, number one uh it's buyer centric right you have to cater to uh, multiple buyers you have to create uh, cater to where they are in the sales process it used to be exactly right. It was one thing you sent an email or you called somebody and it was one to one. Now it's multi-touch attribution. Hmm. And over the last five years, everybody caught up, right? HubSpot has 150,000 paying customers, right? And like lots of people are practicing inbound market. It used to be a competitive advantage in the early days. Now it's table stakes, right? If you, I, I never met a owner who didn't want to get found by somebody looking for their stuff. I'm like, do you want to get found when somebody puts like uh, training manuals in the in a Google search? And they're like, yeah, how do I do that? I'm like, you can either pay Google or you can leverage the technology. But it is harder in a couple of reasons. Number one, it's more expensive to attract, right? HubSpot has this thing called the HubSpot flywheel. And uh, it's uh, attract, engage, and delight. And to attract people, it used to be you put stuff on your um, uh, website. You have a blog, right? You give away all the free stuff that Trainial gives away, which is amazing, by the way. Thank you on behalf of entrepreneurs globally. I'm featuring uh, Trainial in a, a presentation that I'm doing in uh, India in two weeks, right? And uh, that's how I uh, connected with Chris. I've always been a Chris fan. Can I do a Chris Rossio <laughs> plug here? If you must. Okay. Uh, I met Chris uh, like five years ago at a presentation that I did. And he was sitting right up front. He laughed at all my jokes. So I immediately liked him. And he started a great company. And the idea was very, very important, right? Documentation is critical. And what I teach all of my um, portfolio companies and entrepreneurs is you define process. And Chris created software that makes it easy to define that process. And I'm like, okay, I like this company. I like this idea. I like Chris. He's a good man. He's a good person. He's very uh, visible in the Arizona uh, entrepreneur ecosystem. And I'm like, I'm all in. I am all in. And I've been a fan ever since. Anyway, uh, I was doing a program in India and I didn't know if he sold in India. He's like, yeah, we do a little business in India. And I wanted his uh, thoughts and ideas of scaling for a global audience. So we connected and I'm like, okay, I'm going to feature you in a presentation that I'm doing to 300 folks in India. And he's like, okay. 
by the way, you want to come out on my podcast? And I'm like, yeah, that'd be fun. So here I am. Um, that's my little Chris Rangio plug. You can replay that if this is being recorded whenever you're feeling like a slug. So perfect. Um, perfect. My face hurts after I talk to you. Cause I feel like I just smile for a half hour. <laughs> uh, you deserve it, right? You are growing one of the fastest growing companies, not even in Arizona and the Southwest, but in the, uh, in the country, right? You start with helping people. You live the inbound philosophy, right? And you always have, even before I met you, right? Forget about the HubSpot stuff, right? Inbound means a couple of things. Number one, it means helping before you sell, right? And put in the, uh, the comments if you like to help before you sell, right? And most people go, yeah. And that is the right way to do it, right? You don't want a swarmy salesperson calling you up and say, I want to sell you something. They want, you want to like uh, have somebody call you up and say, Chris, I did my research. I understand you're uh, a CEO of a scaling company publishing a book. You have a podcast. And I was wondering if um, you might need a little help to do this. And you're like, oh, my goodness. How do I get like 100 people on my podcast or 1,000 people on my cop? This is the way to do it. So the inbound process is first help, not sell. Right. The second thing is uh, you uh, uh, define your ideal customer profile. Right. You want to make sure that you know exactly uh, who you're selling. to, Right. And uh, that is uh, critically important. Uh, number three, you want to uh, deliver the information where people are. Right. So if they're brand new and in the educational stuff, there's tons of things on your website. Just how to start, how to go. Right. You publish that stuff all the time. Your uh, the, the way in which you provide that value to the community is amazing. Right. Then you want to study everything so that you are assured that uh, you understand what works and what doesn't. Right. And that at the appropriate time. Right. People will cycle in. They will drop their contact information. You want to get to them pretty quickly. Right. You pick up the phone and call. Anybody's listened to this uh, live stream. All right. Don't expect it all to be done on the website. Right. I make my wife, my beautiful wife, Amy. She has to call her prospects. She's like, really? I got to call them. I'm like, yes, you do. She's like, why? I'm like, you want the business? She's like, yeah, I'm well, you got to call. And lots of people say people don't pick up their phone. Have you ever heard that, Chris? Mm -hmm. Like, it's not true, right? Between four and 14 people pick up their phone, 14% uh, of people pick up their phone, right? And if you call somebody professionally, you engage over four times over 12 days. If I want to track you do down like a pig to a truffle, I will get to you, right? And everybody says, that's because you're Dan Tyre. Who's not going to take a call from Dan Tyre? I'm like lots of people who don't know who Dan Tyre is, right? But I'm going to call you four times. I'm going to send you four emails. They're going to be customizable. They're going to be personalized. They're going to be video, right? I do a lot of video prospecting, right? Which they see the gray hair. They see the orange background. They go, okay, that guy's weird. They see the black uh, eyeglasses. They don't forget it. And he's, they're like, yeah, he's the guy who's screaming at me in that video. I put their website on the screen. So they're, why is that like, guy with the gray hair got my website up? They watch the 30 second to 60 second video and then they can respond. After I leave a voicemail in the United States four times, uh, people don't check their voicemail the way they used to, but you'll see four voicemails from 602-432-7451. And you'll be like, like, is this the dentist trying to confirm something? <laughs> then they'll play all four on a Saturday morning right? When they're at the kids' soccer gamers and they're like, who's this guy, Dan Tyre? And then they'll go, oh, that's guy who's emailing me. That's the guy in the little movie. And then about, for my personal statistics, about 87% of people will respond, right? Hmm. Which is amazing. And it's what we teach people all the time. That helps organize the chaos. That's what we call client acquisition. Lead generation is the original inbound. And then client acquisition is how sales and marketing works together. And to cycle back to your point, from 12 minutes ago. Uh, it is more complex. You have to have technology to help you control that, right? It is, even as a solo entrepreneur, you have to have technology. Good news is all you entrepreneurs out there, you were born in the right generation, right? Because in the old days, it was on-premise software. We actually had to buy servers. I tell this story sometimes. My first startup, my second startup, I was CEO and founder. Um, I raised $400,000. I spent $200,000 to buy servers so I could provide email to my employees. Right. And everybody's like, Oh, what, what are you, my grandfather? Wow. Oh, I know. Now, uh, I was just working with Matt Sherman, you know, Matt, he's a entrepreneur yeah. here in Arizona. Yeah, yeah. Matt with one T right. I knew him in yep. preschool, which always makes me feel old when he was in preschool. <laughs> and I'm like, Matt, 
how much does it cost to start a company in Arizona? He's like 50 bucks. The state of Arizona rips you off. I'm like, okay. And, and you get free email from Google and all that kind of stuff. And it's so different, right? That's actually why it's harder. Today, we're Startup Nation. The whole reason people listen to this live stream is because it's so easy to start a company. The, the hard part is you got to differentiate, right? And the way Trainial differentiates is your product and your service and your way you like figure it all uh, together, right? But you have to define that niche. You have to coordinate that chaos. And then you have to make sure that you're delivering a extraordinary customer experience. So right? it, do I have differentiation, I differentiation and standing out, I think is harder now than ever. And so I'll use an example like, um, you know, early, early on in Instagram or in Facebook or any social media, the people that were creating content were sparse. There weren't a lot of content creators. And so it was easy organically to pick up a lot of views and you would get followers and you would grow that. But then when everyone starts producing content, there's like this saturation. And I think the same thing happened when, you know, there were only a few people posting regular blogs, only a few people sending newsletters or putting out great content. So now as that's super saturated today, there's so much information. How do you stand out? How do you be the thing that somebody wants to read and the brand that catches someone's attention? Okay, super smart. And uh, it's right. That's what, one of the things that makes it harder. And everybody's jumped on the train and everybody's working the same kind of thing. Uh, first of all, if you are early adopter, right, you get the other early adopters to follow you. But we're beyond that, right? Even TikTok with billions of uh, folks, right? There, there are new technologies that pop up all the time, right? But the second way to do it is make it easier on yourself. You um, find the appropriate niche. Right. And uh, the riches are in the niches. Hmm. Have you ever heard me say that? I have. Okay. Or if you're in uh, the UK, listen to this broadcast. If you want to go to the beaches, you've got to work the niches, right? Because that's how they <laughs> pronounce it in the UK. And uh, so if you focus on a specific, you're like, no, no, no. We work with software companies that are a million to $3 million that are based in um, Canada and the United States who want to scale 25% in the next three years. Does that sound like you? And uh, you can do the, all the research and your outreach or your in reach, right? It doesn't have to be exact and you can always be opportunistic, but the more yep. that you niche, right? I have a, um, a HubSpot customer. Their focus is, um, it is uh, law firms in the United States and the UK that have at least a hundred uh, billable law lawyers. And how hmm. many people do you think are, is in that niche? 3,000. Uh, 200. What a hundred billable, a hundred billable lawyers is a lot. It's only a handful, wow. right? And it's only two countries, right? I thought it was going to be more. And I'm like, isn't that a little bit of, he's like, Dan, all we need is six customers like that. And we have more business. The, the, this is hard. This is perfect for organized chaos, right? Because I'm asking you to do the hardest thing, right? I'm asking you to be focused, not in all, you can still be opportunistic. But you want to own a niche. The way to own a category is you own a specific niche, right? You are the specific solution for software companies, professional services companies, manufacturing companies in Arizona that are at this level. And if you do that, it's actually easier and quicker to grow because of this, what we call the HubSpot flywheel. And the flywheel is putting your customers at the center, right? This is somewhat controversial, but in 2018, uh, uh, Brian Halligan, the CEO of HubSpot said, your customers are more important than your salespeople for generating new business. And everybody went, ah. and I'm like, he's right. Because in 2022, um, now, first of all, Trainual has great customer satisfaction. You have great customer delight. I know that because I know a couple of your customers and I know you obsess about that, which is the right thing to do. In the old days, we churned through customers like uh, eating tacos. Right. It was like, uh, boom, 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 and we didn't care. Right. You can't do that anymore. In the old days, it was buyer beware. If you bought the wrong software, right. You were out of luck today. If you buy the wrong software, the seller is now responsible for ensuring a delightful experience. So it's easier if you have a niche, it's easier if you are working with the same vocabulary, the seasonality, the right in and out all the time, that's the HubSpot flywheel with the customers at the center. And in the old days, I used to be able to um, bring in a, a, like a reference at the end. Right now for HubSpot, we have these things called hub fans and hub fans is our best customers that we use at the front of the sales process. Hmm. They don't want to talk to me. 
They want to talk to uh, Dan Moyle or they want to talk to Trig Viola or they want to talk to somebody who's like, no, no, no. Let me tell you what it's like to work with them. And they describe the delight experience. Remember, attract, which we're both agreeing is harder and chaotic. So you need technology. There's the engage, which is the handoff and what you do specifically for your customers that you need to lean in and really understand who they are, what they need, what they want, how you make them feel good. And then there's the delight. And part of delight is making them feel special, making them feel welcome and helping them help you by bringing on new customers. The idea of having hub fans and putting fans or uh, turning every sale almost into a referral by putting fans at the beginning of your process, I think is genius because a lot of people will put testimonials out on the website and they'll use that as an authority builder or a reference point when people are shopping around. But to actually connect someone with a customer at the beginning of the process turns every lead into a referral and referrals are always the best close close rate. And so I think that's genius. Thanks for sharing that. No so, worries. I ask people, do you need more word of mouth leads? Right? No one's ever said no. No, no one's ever said no. It's universal. I think that's the only question I've ever asked that's run the table. No one has ever said, nah, I don't need more word of mouth leads. And do you like word of mouth leads, Chris? Yes. Why? Of course. Okay. You if you it. had broken my streak, I would have gotten out of this LinkedIn live immediately. But uh, <laughs> why do you like word of mouth leads? Because they're 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 the warmest. They have like some background history to go by. They believe that it's going to work, and so they get past some of the objections. They close at the highest rates. They're the biggest advocates. They have the most net revenue retention. All those reasons. Okay, and you're right. They move more quickly. They're less cost sensitive. If my buddy Chris Ronzio says no, 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 no just go over and uh, work with uh, Kaiser for finding your next location, I'm like, okay, uh, I know Chris, I trust Chris, I trust Chris's recommendation. He says to go to Kaiser, that's where I'm headed, right? And so that process of creating that, right? People, I ask people, do you have a strategy for creating word of mouth leads? They, they're like, no, that's not the way it works. I'm like, that's the way it can work. And they're like, you can get me a strategy for word of mouth leads. I'm like, yeah, it's called the flywheel. It's the extension of the inbound sales process, right? In which... It's not just bringing leads in, but it also includes the lead generation, customer acquisition, which we're talking about. And now the next step is building this community, right? And you and Trent did such a good job of sending me these really smart questions. And you wanted to talk a little bit about the community or the next level, right? And a, a, a community is super hot. It's super important. And you have this trainual community. I saw that you uh, 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 are promoting your um, get together with Seth Goat. What is that called yeah. again? Playbook. Playbook. Playbook when is that? Twenty-two September twenty-second. How, how come you haven't invited me to speak? We have to work on that afterwards. But I, kind like of your you, tryout. So we'll see. Awesome. <laughs> uh, uh, I know you've had some world-class speakers in the past and it looks like a great event. Seth Godin, I got Seth and I at a picture on my phone, right? Uh, I knew Seth Godin when he had hair, which is kind of amazing. And he <laughs> it, like, it's world-class kind of speakers, right? It, that community of people coming together to talk about how to manage the chaos and how to work all together. It's so refreshing, right? And creating those communities right? Is uh, you either let it happen automatically or you lean in to understand the key components of what it's going to take to be successful, right? And uh, it, like, just like everything else, like a strategy for word of mouth leads. There's a strategy for creating these communities, which is the extension of inbound in uh, 2022 um, so that um, those people get together, right? Because as fun as it is to have a hub fan talk to a new customer, when hub fans get together, right? It's like my hair blows off, right? They're like talking about all the stuff that they did and all the things that they're doing and they're learning from each other, right? Which uh, from like a company perspective, reduces your training costs, reduces your support costs. It gets this whole, they're, they're talking about your product. They're sharing it with all these people. They're extending the uh, program. They're working on new business development and it's a plus, plus, plus for everybody. It's one of the few things in business that's good for the customer, good for the prospects, good for the partners, good for the ecosystem, right? And you have to organize what typically happened um, like organically in a way in which you can lean into this uh, flywheel, the next extension of inbound for success. 
So if you can create this flywheel that keeps generating referrals and that, you know, keeps being additive for everybody that's in there, how is that different than just the traditional sales funnel? Because a lot of people think, all right, sales, I've got a funnel, bring them in, you know, close the deal. Um, how, how would they differ? Yeah. So the old days in the funnel, there was a salesperson and the salesperson determined whether you're going to the next stage of the funnel, right? Salesperson has much less power now because you're not get going in a funnel. I do a lot of consulting and I'll ask the CEO. I'll ask you now, do you like a sales funnel, Chris? Uh, no, I like okay. the, I like when customers want to just knock on your door and buy it rather you than say, you knocking on their door. Every CEO, uh, CEO I've ever said, say, I like my sales funnel. I'm like, no, no, no. Do you like being in, in a sales funnel? They're like, no, I hate that. I don't want to be uh, like uh, tied to a particular um, person. And a sales funnel is sales oriented. Today it's buyer oriented. A buyer can cycle in whenever they want, right? So now you have to manage a wider um, mm. like a group. Now you have to know, that's what we call a lead notification. I need to know when Chris Ronzio is on my website because I got five minutes to call you. And if I call you and say, Chris, you're on the pricing page. How, how can I be of service, right? First of all, you know I'm calling because you see my phone number. Second of all, you're like, how did you know that? And I'm like, well, little bird told me. And of course, it's the technology. My opening line, if I called you, I'm like, Chris, this isn't too creepy, is it? And you'd be like, yeah, it is a little creepy tire. I'm like, yeah, HubSpot technology. <laughs> then I need to know, wait a second, Chris, we did, haven't talked to, since 2017. Remember we did that whole big thing and I talked with your brother and we were w working on like a, 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 a CMS or a CRM or something like that. From and you're like, wow, yeah, I do remember, I that. remember I that. I know. Yeah. If, if, if I don't have it in my CRM, it's not the, the um, conversation is going to start. Uh, much different, right? Yeah. So being intentional, the whole idea of the inbound revolution is being intentional. The book I wrote called the inbound organizations was all about how to be intentional to cure the chaos, right? It's all about how you ensure, right? That you have your processes, which Tranial is a world leader on these processes. That's why when I speak globally, I always like put your logo in there and talk about your success, right? Because it's uh, in endearing. Uh, it's important and processes are um, a foundation of scale. And I know you've talked a lot about that and uh, that's critically important. And all the entrepreneurs out there who are working on multiple spreadsheets and writing things down, they all know exactly what you're talking about, right? And technology solves that. And it's not technology that costs a million dollars. It's technology that's relatively inexpensive, especially based, easy to use, right? I was given a presentation and I was trying to explain what a user manual was, right? When's the last time you saw a user manual? Um, I see them a lot because sometimes we tear them up in ads. <laughs> okay, there we go. Okay, all right. They're like these 20 somethings, they're like, what's a user manual? I'm like, it's this big fat book with 300 pages that they used to send to you to help explain Microsoft Windows. And they're like, like yeah. YouTube? And I'm like, no, it's nothing like YouTube. And like, <laughs> what would you do with it? Like, who would absolutely read, other than my father in law, a 300 page uh, manual? Right. And uh, like a user manual is is gone. Now it has to be online. Now it has to be easy to use. Now it has to On be demand. like, exactly, exactly. And yeah. you have to be able to find the stuff super simple or it doesn't work. And all of that leads itself to um, solving the chaos, making sure that you have the processes so that you can study, you can understand the data and you can deliver what uh, people want so that um, you can get the right information to the right person at the right time. If you can do that in that particular niche, right? You can be successful, right? We know that. And that lead generation and customer acquisition, right? The third, we call them magic words. The third uh, is customer engagement. We want to make sure that everybody signs on, uses the technology. You don't have good customer engagement. The, the handoff has to be seamless. The onboarding needs to be great. It could be uh, no touch. It could be low touch. It could be high touch. It could be a range of those kind of things, but you got to make sure people get off the schneid. Like everybody obsesses about the, um, the new business development, right? It's mm. not, that's just the start of the relationship. Now you got to get the people to use it, get value out of it. And then the delight phase is the final phase. And that's where the community comes in, right? Uh, I think uh, Trent asked me for two examples, right? Tranial is a good example, but that was just off the top of my head. What is uh, some of the best communities you know, Chris? Best communities. Um, the Apple fans, there you we know, go. the, the products. Ridiculous. Yeah. 
right? Apple's a religion. Are you kidding me? If I ever talked PCs with uh, my brother-in-law, right? They wouldn't talk to me anymore, right? The fact that I use a PC, I'm a pariah. I can't even bring it to the house. I have to like check it in the garage or something like that. That's a great example. Uh, number two, I'm from New York and uh, one of the communities I'm involved in is the New York Mets. Do you know anything about the Mets? Yeah, I know. I know more about Arizona teams, but New York Mets. <laughs> Being a Mets fan since 19, in 1969, I was like uh, 11 years old and the New York Mets came from nowhere to win the World Series and it changed my life. I've been a rooter of the underdog and a, a, a like um, counterintuitive investor and I have just been a contrarian for my whole life because I had, a, you know, I had a Mets hat once because everyone else was wearing Yankees hats and I wanted to be a little different. <laughs> okay. Uh, when I grew up in New York, everybody was a Yankee fan and I'm like, screw that. I'm going to do the, and then they won the World Series and I'm like, yeah. And being a Met fan is hard, but they have the community, right? You support the community by buying those hats, those jerseys, right? Uh, uh, the Mets games are on Twitter now all the time, which is amazing. You go to the games, right? We now have a good owner, Stephen Cohen, right? He spent a lot of money. We have the largest payroll in um, Major League, $290 million payroll because uh, Steve Cohen is worth $14 billion and he wants to win a World Series. So he's investing in the team. Uh, but for 30 years, right, we defined ourselves. You see the Boston caps in Arizona. You see the Diamondback caps totally. all the time. Yeah. You never saw a Met cap, right? No one ever wore their Met baseball cap on an airplane the way the Boston or the Yankees peoples do because it was embarrassing, right? You were a sta you were in the community that the only people that were recognized that community were people that uh, were dysfunctional. And understood that 30 years of like rooting for a team that was never going to win was somehow therapeutic or that was your genetics. Right. And uh, so it's a perfect example of community because everybody come together, commiserate, elicit emotion. Right. Just pay money to be part of that community. Uh, maybe not me because I'm the cheapest guy in North America, but most <laughs> people would buy the jerseys. Right. And uh, an example of. Uh, creating a um, a community, a, a, a B2C community that's very, very helpful. So you can kind of at the top of my screen, see this little basketball yeah. and I, I'm, a, I'm a huge Phoenix Suns fan. And so okay. I think the lesson here, which is so great that you're sharing is that how do we get our customers and our communities at work to be as engaged as a sports fan is in their team? You know, like, how do you want to talk about it? How do you want to buy the merchandise? How do you be proud that you're part of this? That you talk to the other fans that you're sharing about news. Um, that's something that I think we can all aspire to. So great tip there. And then also about the flywheel versus the funnel. I love the super simple distinction of it's seller oriented versus buyer oriented. And if we can create processes that are reacting to when a buyer is on a page and wants to buy, that's entirely different than interrupting somebody. So such great tips there. I've got to ask though about the changing environment right now. So there's so many things that are changing with, you know, privacy laws and we can't have the tracking on the ads and the price of ads is, is going up on all these platforms. And so what, what should marketers or companies be doing differently for their marketing or sh marketing, as you say, strategies, <laughs> given these current challenges? Yeah. Lean into the community, right? A good idea. You want to make sure you never lose a customer, right? Unless everybody has customers they want to get rid of right? Fire those customers, right? Replace them with people that are more mainstream where you're providing the best value, where you know you can hit the ball out of the park, where you know that you get 10 out of NPS. I always ask the question, Chris, um, do you have a happy customer? Everybody always says yes. Another universal yes. I'm like, how do you know? And they're like, oh, all the people I talk to are happy. I'm like, no, no, no. You don't do an NPS survey every month. And they're like, what's NPS? Right. And I know you know that, but uh, yeah. net promoter score is a great way to get the tangible data of understanding how valuable you are. And in some of the companies I've invested, when they've gone out and done their first NPS, it's uh, a, a great awakening to make sure that you have the tangible uh, data, that you're studying exactly what you need to improve that experience. Right. So you want to uh, lean into that customer base, lean into that community. You want to do special uh, uh, marketing just for your customers, right? Not just for everybody, but you want to have special webinars. You want to uh, have a customer council. You want to make sure that you as the CEO are picking up the phone and calling your top 10 customers, right? Uh, this is a great story. I did a program in uh, Arizona at a local restaurant and the, guy, the owner of the restaurant called me up and said, how did it go? I'm like, it was awesome. He's like, I want all your business. And I just happened to pick up which refutes the, the uh, point that people never pick up. 
And uh, I'm like, who is this? He's like, uh, you held a, a function at my restaurant last night. I'm like, you're the owner? And he's like, yeah. And he's like, it looked like it was awesome. I'm like, it was awesome. He goes, I want all your business. I'm like, you got it. One phone wow. call. I locked in the next 12 events that I'm ever going to do. I'm always going to do it. At, the guy was nice enough. So I tell all entrepreneurs, every Friday, you pick up the phone and call two folks that are your top customers. You say, um, uh, Chris, this is Dan from HubSpot. I want to thank, because the first time they might not pick up. I want to thank you for your business. You're, uh, we've been working together for almost a year. I appreciate your help. I appreciate you being a customer. We want to be the best partner we can possibly be. Here's my cell phone. If you ever have a call, you call me directly. And if a CEO calls you with that message, right? Number one, it's impressive. Number two, you're like, okay, yeah, I got a direct like lying to the top. Number three, right? Oh, you can always say the second time you call them, call them every six months. You're like, by the way, stroke your chin and go, do you know anybody that might be interested, not a direct competitor that may uh, be helpful for HubSpot or training or something like that? And it could be a, a good way. Okay, I'll make it easy for you. That's my big line, right? How can I ma make it easy for you? I want to do the introduction, but if you know anybody, right? I want to make, that's what everybody wants. Everybody wants to make it easy for mm -hmm. what they're doing. I love that. Such a simple tip. I started messaging uh, our, our list of top customers a few a week on LinkedIn, just starting conversations. We don't have everybody's phone numbers, but I started just messaging people on LinkedIn and the responses I get back are amazing. I have conversations with these people. I've hopped on a couple of Zooms with them. And uh, sure. I, I think that's such a great tip and it's something a lot of people don't do. You're proving my point, right? You're a new age entrepreneur. You're a good guy. You're actively involved in customer delight. Right. As the top dog, you're working to try to understand unfettered feedback. It will pay a huge dividend. OK, so events, community, CEO calling, measuring NPS, all these things. Are there channels, marketing channels that you think people should be leaning into right now? <laughs> yeah. Uh, are you looking at the chat? Because uh, Trent is messaging us saying we need to leave a few minutes for comments in the chat pane. And okay, uh, first well, of all. I think this is Joe's question, actually. One of two things working best for you now. So we can put Joe's question up. Joe, thank you for the question. But um, are, are there a couple channels that you think are really working? Yeah. So number one, uh, we have this event called Inbound. <coughs> and Inbound uh, will have 10,000 people here. It's held in Boston every year. Uh, Barack Obama is speaking this year. And it is quite amazing. Right. We lean into those events because it gives opportunity for people to come together this year. It's live. The last two years, it's all been or three years has been virtual. Right. But I think uh, human beings are social animals. And even if you're um, I urge even startups like uh, folks that only have six customers, get all six customers in a room, buy them breakfast, mm -hmm. do a lunch and learn. Right. Uh, just get everybody together to start the establishing the community early. And if you do that, number one, you got the motion. Number two, you want to thank those early customers, right? Um, being an early customer for a startup company is sometimes hard, right? Not everything is baked. Not all the technology is kind of there and the ability to uh, thank them, to stay close to them, to appreciate them, right? And um, to uh, get them together, right? I think goes a long way and it's inexpensive. Right. You pay 50 bucks for some Subway sandwiches. Right. Or some breakfast sandwiches. And you just get everybody in your office or if they have to come in glow, uh, like uh, via Zoom or LinkedIn because you don't want to um, they don't want to drive. That's OK, too. Right. But it, uh, human beings are like they're social animals and the ability to get everybody together, understand they're all working through the problem is exactly the reason why you run an organized chaos. Right. Because everybody has the same problem. If they can pick up one thing, call in your best customer, understanding how to optimize the website understanding their niche, understanding the inbound organization that it's worth a 45 minute business. You know, quick case study for that. In the first year of Trainual, we had our, our first five or six affiliates or people that were referring us. We had them all fly in for an event that we put on for them in that day. And in the last couple of years, they've probably generated over a million dollars in business for us. But it was because we just got them all together in the same room and had them talking. And so that so beautifully sums up like, connecting that's what it's all about building a community where people can connect where they can evangelize what you're doing or they can share their success and their stories and their tips so all of that just creates a buyer first process and i think that's what this is all about okay that was a great sum up oh my goodness did you have that written down somewhere chris ronzio you're like a genius uh, very very good and you're a great you're, entrepreneur 
you're a genius too. So where can people follow you if they want to hear more Dan Tire? Uh, just connect on uh, LinkedIn, uh, Dan Tire, executive of HubSpot. Uh, DanTire.com is my website, right? I do a lot of public speaking. My uh, mission is to do the most good for the universe, right? I uh, periodically invest in companies, although I miss Trainual, which I uh, give Chris a little bit of a hard time about, but uh, one of two companies that I missed, but uh, you guys are doing fine without Dan Tire's help. And um, I'm like, I want to help people. Right. Uh, the most fun I have is coming on podcasts like this. Right. I like three today, three presentations, because um, with a little bit of experience, right, uh, helping entrepreneurs scale is my passion. I started HubSpot for startups at uh, HubSpot. Right. I love HubSpot. I'm still fully employed there after 15 years. Right. I got a big orange heart. They're going to have to carry me out in an orange coffin. Right. It's an amazing company. Right. That helps uh, millions of uh, individuals, companies grow better. Right. It's great to be associated with the company. No one would uh, recognize me if I didn't wear my HubSpot T-shirt. And um, I'm at people service. If I can be helpful, just let me know. And to the extent of my bandwidth, I'll um, try to deliver. Well, thank you so much, Dan. And even though you didn't invest, I appreciate all your help from the sidelines. Thanks for being here. I really appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you very much, Chris. All right, everyone, thank you for tuning in. That will do it for our live stream. Dan is such a great guy. If you're seeing Dan for the first time, you gotta see that that energy is just contagious, infectious. Like I love listening to him talk and share his nuggets of wisdom. So if you're in sales, hopefully you got some great tips about those four follow-ups in 12 days about calling people because 14% of them pick up. If you're in marketing or schmarketing, like he says, hopefully you can grab some insights on how to be more aligned and take people through a buyer centric process. Uh, if you tuned in from the very beginning, he had some facts to drop about sea otters. So if you're into that, go back to the beginning and rewatch that. That was fun. But uh, such a great presentation. If you're seeing this for the first time, we do Organized Chaos live on LinkedIn, but we also do it five days a week on your podcast, wherever you get your podcast. So tune in this week for episodes like Creating the Perfect Investor Pitch, How to Measure Success, uh, an episode with Tony, who's the CEO of Oyster, about employing people across the world in different countries, the future of remote work. There's always new topics five days a week. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next time on Organized Chaos.